This is a traditional court, which is the means by which ordinary rural people most often seek access to justice. Gathering in families and local villages, the courts can offer an informal, inexpensive and accessible pathway to justice to more than 17 million South Africans living in these former homeland areas. We were also trying to uh, talk to the people who were quarreling in their homes and try to make a peace uh, between some of those people. This woman is testifying in a village court in Limpopo, where a number of members of the village have gathered to form a village council that will decide a dispute. But a controversial new draft bill, the traditional courts bill, introduced by government in 2008, threatens the right to justice of this woman and millions of other rural people if it is passed into law. The traditional courts bill is a piece of draft legislation that's supposed to address the problem of um, administration of justice, access to justice in rural areas. Uh, it's supposed to replace a piece of legislation that was um, passed in 1927 called the Black Administration Act. The traditional courts bill is supposed to overhaul that legislation by firstly bringing traditional courts into um, greater alignment with the constitution um, and its values and then secondly trying to improve the, the sort of harmonization of the um, uh, traditional justice system with the state court system. Currently, customary law occurs in most rural areas where any men from the rural community may participate in asking questions and deliberating over matters that come before their local village court. This allows the community to participate in the making and application of customary law. Traditional courts still function under the Black Administration Act 38 of 1927. This legislation is terribly out of date. We're challenging the bill because um, the consequences of uh, the senior traditional leader being the only person forming the court um, operates to the exclusion of, of um, the rest of the community. And in terms of the constitutional court, uh, the court has recognized that living customary law is formed by the community. And so in this way, the community would be de denied um, their ability to participate in the formation of living customary law in effective terms. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, the traditional courts bill um, was drafted only in consultation with traditional leaders, whether um, the National House of Traditional Leaders or um, uh, traditional leaders at national and provincial level. This is what the memorandum to the bill says. Um, these are the people who were, who were consulted, as well as the South African Local Government Association. But no ordinary people were consulted. The bill must be understood in the context of another law, Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act, introduced in 2003 specifically dealing with the powers of traditional leaders. This law entrenches the old tribal boundaries established under apartheid. It also basically reinforces traditional authority structures created under the Bantu Authorities Act of 1951. ANC stalwarts like Albert Lutuli, Govan Mbeki and Nelson Mandela rejected these structures as being illegitimate instruments of the apartheid government. You know, our, our great politicians talked about how what the Bantu Authorities Act did was um, set in stone a system of indirect rule through chiefs and how it completely um, destroyed the, the accountable nature of customary law by making chiefs accountable upwards to government as opposed to accountable to their people. Those boundaries were extremely controversial because chiefs who went along with the Bantustan um, uh, policy were rewarded with big areas of land and high status, and those who opposed it got very small areas of land. And you know the, the Constitutional Court in the case about the Communal Land Rights Act, uh, the Deputy Chief Justice Dehang Mosuneki made this remark that it is completely extraordinary that new laws should be based on those boundaries. So what the Framework Act did is it entrenches those old boundaries and it takes anyone who is officially recognized by government prior to 1994 
and deems them to be recognised as a senior traditional leader. And that's very important for the traditional courts bill because the areas of jurisdiction of these courts are now the areas of the old tribal authority um, boundaries. And, and the, the traditional courts bill gives traditional leaders extraordinary powers to punish people living within those boundaries. The law, race and gender unit at the University of Cape Town has been arguing the unconstitutionality of the traditional courts bill and working towards ensuring that ordinary rural people are fully consulted about the bill and their voices taken into account. <laughs> The unit partnered with the Legal Resources Center and local community-based organizations to run a series of workshops around the country in order to consult and educate rural communities on the traditional courts bill. These workshops and empirical research form the foundation of LRG's arguments about the problems rural people face before some traditional courts and their concerns with the bill in its current form. At the workshops, a number of rural women spoke about their experiences when dealing with traditional leaders and how unfair practices are being used to exclude them from their rights to justice. Uh, she raised an issue about the fact that if a child is pregnant, then the family of the pregnant child must pay the chief. And what, and, but what she complains about is that they're not there to assist the family once the child is born or if they need to consult with the boy's family about various customary issues that we all understand. Someone uh, has a member who passes away, because you know you usually have to wear uh, those yes, mourning clothes, mourn, to mourn, yes. You have to pay 300 rand in order for you to get permission to take it off. If you don't have money, you will be wearing it for the rest of your life. Yeah. Our work in the former homeland areas came out of consultations with women that were living in rural areas. And that's a basic premise of LRG's work, is that um, we need to take seriously the stories that rural women and other marginalized people are telling about their social and material existence and the struggles that they're undertaking. So part of what we do is legal education. Um, and we see that as a responsibility um, that we have and we see that as a service that we can provide. Uh, we don't go in and tell people first up that the traditional courts bill is very messed up. Mm -hmm. um, what we do is we go in and our, our method generally in, in workshops is to spend a substantial time right up front talking about people's experiences of traditional leadership and governance. We're able to bring people from deeply rural areas um, into Parliament and we're able to make that connection with parliamentarians, with legal decision makers, legislative decision makers. Uh, we're able to bring these cases right from the ground, right through to the constitutional court. And we're able to tell those stories, and I'd like to think that we're able to tell those stories with a lot of integrity. Um, and that's because we take those voices very seriously, and we take those partnerships very seriously. We spend a lot of time thinking about what it means to be in partnership with a rural community or a rural CBO and what our obligations are to provide support to those um, rural partners. But we equally, equally think about what are our obligations in respect of Parliament um, and our partners, for example, at the Legal Resources Centre or the Women's Legal Centre. From the onset, it was clear to gender activists that this bill would not tackle the key areas needed to remedy the inequalities in traditional courts, but rather threatens to entrench the problems encountered by rural women in their attempts to gain access to justice. The traditional courts bill um, in section 9 says that um, uh, a husband can represent a wife and a wife can represent a husband and in fact other members of the family can represent one another um, in accordance with customary law. Now anyone who knows anything about customary law will tell you that it is unheard of virtually for a man to be represented by a woman but women are very very often represented by men and especially widows um, are disadvantaged by this because 
um, when a spouse dies, um, a woman is considered, whilst she's been in mourning, she'll be considered to be um, unpure. And sometimes traditional courts are held in kraals and such um, spaces which are considered sacred spaces. And so widows are then excluded from participating in the disputes pertaining to the property in the context of land grabbing, perhaps by, um, you know, um, uh, family members of that spouse who has now died. Um, and then that woman would have to be represented by male members of the family. And so women then are disadvantaged because they can't defend themselves effectively against, you know, this property grabbing. Um, and so problems like that are not addressed by the traditional courts bill. In fact, it, even though it, it suggests that formally women and men are in, on, in an equal position. The truth is that they're not, because in, in accordance with customary law, women would be represented by men, not the other way around. In terms of the bill, traditional leaders wield more powers without needing to be accountable to their people. Given the ambiguity in the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Act of 2003 about the power of traditional authorities to impose annual levies on ordinary rural people, traditional courts are sometimes used to enforce payment of such levies. In practice, rural people are sometimes refused dispute resolution services if they have not fully paid their levies and can even have heavy punishment imposed on them for non-payment. This is despite the fact that the Constitution seems quite clear that levying powers cannot be assigned to traditional authorities. The powers given to traditional leaders under the traditional courts bill would enable the situation to worsen. Now the problem is that, that in rural areas people don't have official addresses. So when they go and apply for an identity document, they have to go to the tribal office to get a letter stamped vouching that they are a resident of that area. When they apply for pensions, child support grants, even to open a bank account, even to get a car license, they have to get the stamp. And you can't get that stamp unless you're up to date with all your tribal levies. And many people have refused to pay these things for decades. Uh, in fact, levies were a fundamental flashpoint for the anti bantustan rebellions in the 80s, the extortionist levies that were being extracted from people. In those days, the annual levies in this area were 160 rand, um, which was a lot of money in those days. But you're talking about a lot of money now, because in this area, Matlala, there are 23 villages, um, you know, with maybe 5,000 people 5,000 families in each. So you, you're looking at a lot of money and there's a lot of resistance, uh, but, but people can't access their basic South African citizenship rights without paying these back levies. And we hadn't understood the extent of the problem until we started to have workshops around the traditional courts bill. At a panel discussion hosted by the Institute for Security Studies, a number of speakers shared their views on the traditional courts bill. Nomfundo Goboto, a regional director from the Legal Resources Center, said the bill does not allow for opting out. This means that people who did not want to attend the traditional court and have their dispute resolved under the customary law could not choose to rather have their matter heard in a magistrate's court. This can be very problematic where traditional courts are dysfunctional, unaccountable, and do not dispense true justice because people would not have a way of avoiding them. Therefore, by uh, customary courts have a right to opt out. And this um, bill actually st states that um, you have no right to opt out of the um, <coughs> customary court. In fact, if you do, then you have committed an offense and uh, you can be punished by the um, traditional court. The traditional court can impose fines and can actually uh, order someone to pay um, or to perform unpaid labor as, as a form of pun punishment. You can be deprived of, of your customary entitlements. Hoshi Setlamorago Tovejani, a traditional leader representing Contralesa on the panel, defended the bill and the role of traditional leaders, saying it is a misrepresentation by activists to portray traditional leaders as autocratic leaders with no accountability. 
In the end, Mazibuko Jaha from LRG summed up the debate by relating stories of corrupt traditional leaders who need to be challenged but would become untouchable under the traditional courts bill. The bill was withdrawn from the National Assembly in June 2011. Then, on the 13th of December, the Department of Justice publicized its intention to reintroduce the bill in the National Council of Provinces in January 2012. It gave two months over Christmas for people to make submissions, setting a 15 February deadline for all submissions. The bill was formally reintroduced in the NCOP on 26 January 2012. From here, members of the Select Committee will take it to their provinces for rural consultations. Once the NCOP has made amendments and a decision about the bill, the bill will return to the National Assembly. Most rural people remain unaware of the bill's existence. To compensate for the lack of publicity, LRG's rural partners are mobilizing with the support of LRG and its civil society partners to ensure that the people in their provinces are made aware of the bill's content and implications. In summary, the objections leveled against the bill are that it permits a presiding officer who is the senior traditional leader to have single-handed and final say on what is customary law. It excludes forms of community participation, other dispute resolution forums, and accountability mechanisms. It reinforces contested colonial and apartheid tribal boundaries as jurisdictional boundaries. It prohibits opting out of traditional court's jurisdiction, even by people with legitimate objections. It would negatively affect the rights of women, especially by not providing for them to represent themselves. It allows for forced labor and deprivation of customary benefits to be imposed as punishment. Ultimately, the Law, Race and Gender Unit and its partners are calling for new legislation to be drafted based on the views and needs expressed by ordinary rural people in the process of their consultation to replace the Traditional Courts Bill. So, the Traditional Courts Bill is patently unconstitutional as it stands. So the content of the bill is problematic. Um, and, and that's open to constitutional challenge. But then there's another side to it, which is the fact that there's been inadequate public consultation on it. Um, and, you know, again, I keep coming back to this. You know, what must the quality of the consultation be? You know, what sort of an obligation must there be on Parliament to go into affected areas and to hear about people's experiences of traditional courts. I mean, what we try to do um, is to bring those voices to Parliament. But that's a second best. That's really a second best to Parliament actually going to the people uh, with, a, with a seriousness of purpose, you know, not, not just a sort of window dressing. Um, and if that doesn't happen, the Constitutional Court has been very clear that where there's inadequate consultation, uh, the, the resultant legislation will be unconstitutional. They're going to have to go back and start again. Um, our position would be that they should rather start again now than to go through all of that litigation only to be told in the constitutional court, as they undoubtedly will be, um, that the process has been inadequate. Um, but then more than that, we're also um, uh, looking at, at continuing this research so that we can um, uh, continue to engage with, with government and try to facilitate um, a process by which new legislation can be brought into being that replaces the traditional courts bill but, um, but actually replaces it with legislation that builds from the reality that ordinary people are living in. <laughs>